Prime Time Crimes presents this true crime education video to highlight and to help us understand that you are more likely to meet your demise by someone you know. I will add my observations and comments to help us recognize the early warning signs that are depicted in this crime story. If we can watch this video and learn about these warning signs, we will be educated instead of just entertained. More importantly, we will be able to detect these warning signs and take the necessary steps to remove ourselves from someone who is a potential danger or threat to our safety. This video is an example of someone who took the life of someone they know. There were warning signs prior to the tragic incident depicted in this video and even though the warning signs vary in each video we present, they all follow the same theme. The key is to not only recognize these warning signs, you will have to take the necessary steps to remove yourself from danger if you recognize these signs in your life. Jefferson, Wisconsin, April 3rd, 1994. It was Easter Sunday in this sleepy town of 6,000, an hour west of Milwaukee. Jefferson is typical small town USA, mostly rural. There's no big city atmosphere at all. It's gorgeous, it's pastoral, and it's generally very quiet. But not that Sunday, because at around 3.30 that morning, one 16-year-old Jefferson resident was rudely awakened by a pair of loud bangs. He wasn't sure exactly what he had heard, but he had heard a noise that was enough to wake him up. And once he was fully awake, the teenager realized just what the noises had been. He smelled gunpowder. And since he could smell it, the gunshots had come from somewhere in the house. And then, even as that terrifying realization sank in, the teenager heard something else. He could hear some noise that he described as kind of a moaning noise. And it was coming from downstairs. He went to investigate and found his father slumped over, blood covering his t-shirt. The boy's father, 40-year-old Ruben Borkart, had been shot. It was to the upper torso, lower chest area. So, you know, it was obviously a grievous wound. However, despite the bloody gunshot wound to his chest, Ruben was still alive and conscious. He was able to talk. But for how long? He was having a hard time catching his breath. He was able to give his son a brief description of the shooters, though. He said two guys did it. But that wasn't all he said. Reuben told his son that he knew he was dying. Reuben's son refused to believe it. His son went and called 911. And within minutes, first responders rushed in to save Reuben's life. Deputies arrived on the scene shortly after the 911 phone call had come in. And they would arrive long before Reuben's wife, 44-year-old Diane Borkhart. His son's stepmother, she was away that Easter weekend visiting the boy's grandparents in the remote town of Tomahawk, Wisconsin. She was three hours away. But when word of the shooting reached Diane later that morning, would she be shocked? Or was it her community that was in for a shock? Born in 1949, Diane Fister grew up about an hour south of Jefferson in the small town of Rochelle, Illinois. That's where her family lived. After high school, Diane married and settled down. But happily ever after wasn't in the cards. Her first husband died. It was a work accident. He was a utility worker, got killed on the job. Soon after the accident, Diane, still in her 20s, left Illinois when she got a job in Jefferson, just over the state line in Wisconsin. She started working at Schweiger's Industries, which was a uh, furniture factory. She worked in the office. She was the secretary. And it was at Schweiger that Diane first met Ruben Borkhart, who worked on the factory floor as a carpenter. Four years younger than Diane, Ruben had lived in Jefferson his whole life. Ruben was a hometown boy. His family is, is local. Jefferson, especially in the 50s and 60s of Ruben's childhood, was an idyllic place to grow up. It's a beautiful place with rivers running through it and nice bike trails for people, lakes to sail and fish. And Ruben was the all-American boy. Ruben was a happy kid. He was nice. He was gentle. He was kind. He went to uh, Jefferson High School. He married a Jefferson girl. Ruben's first wife was on the cheerleading squad, and they met in high school, and they were high school sweethearts. 
It's that kind of place, you know, sort of iconic heartland America. Reuben and his first wife married young and had two children. But then, in 1979, when the couple was expecting their third child, tragedy struck. His first wife died in a car accident. It was in the winter. We had a snowstorm, and the wind was blowing pretty good. The death of his wife and unborn child left Reuben devastated and desperate. There he is, a young man with two very small children to raise. For comfort and support, he turned to two things. The first was his faith. He was a very religious man. And the other was Diane. When Reuben met the factory's new secretary, it wasn't long before he realized they had something in common. Diane and Reuben both lost their spouses. After he lost his wife, Reuben turned to Diane, who'd gone through a similar loss just two years earlier. They were both kind of on the rebound. However, what started out as advice and support swiftly turned into something more. He needed help with the kids and stuff, and uh, that's how the relationship started. Reuben was, you know, looking for someone maybe to take the place of his wife. And soon after they started dating, Diane essentially did just that. She, you know, moved in and started taking care of those children. And since they were both less than four years old, they were too young to have many memories of their real mother. She sort of took over that role. Diane had just turned 30 when she married Reuben in October of 1979, less than a year after the accident. It was kind of a, a quick romance. Diane helped Reuben finish the new home he was building when his first wife died. With Reuben being a carpenter, their home had a lot of nice touches to it. Including a nursery. Because soon after the wedding, Diane announced that she was pregnant. Within a year of, of marriage, Diane and Reuben had their daughter. Once the baby was born, Diane quit her job at the furniture factory and spent the next few years focused on raising the couple's three children. But once her youngest daughter was old enough to start kindergarten, Diane took a new job at Jefferson High. She was a teacher's aide and a study hall monitor. She was popular with the students, too. She was, you know, bubbly, friendly. She was somebody that... You know, the kids felt very comfortable talking to. She's known as Mrs. B. And while she wasn't officially the guidance counselor, the students often took their troubles to Mrs. B. She was very kind to the students, would even give them advice, listen to their problems. In 1988, the 38-year-old also opened a side business. She had a print shop that was called Mrs. B's T-shirt shop, and she printed T-shirts for local events. And if anything, that made her even more popular with the town's teenagers. She employed some of the young people in the community. Others simply hung out at the shop. There was always kids in there, and they'd come in, hey, Mrs. B, what's up? And can I do this? Can I do that for you? The kids loved her. She was just like a mother hand to them. Meanwhile, Reuben had left his factory job behind and launched a new career, too, opening his own woodworking shop. He was a cabinet maker. He had a business attached to his home. And by the fall of 93, after 14 years of marriage, it looked as if the couple had put their past tragedies behind them. They have sort of this relatively typical blended family that's typical of America in many ways. Most people thought they were Barbie and Ken, that they had an ideal relationship, they had a good family life, they were church goers, everything was great. It was really a very uh, good life. But on Easter weekend of 1994, while Diane and her youngest daughter were away visiting her stepchildren's grandparents, tragedy would strike one more time. Early on Sunday morning, April 3rd, 1994, the Jefferson County, Wisconsin Sheriff's Department received an urgent 911 call. Someone had apparently broken into Diane Borkhart's home and shot her husband, Reuben Borkhart. Reuben's son heard some sort of a noise, and he went to find out what it was and found that his dad had been shot. And despite two gunshot wounds to the chest, the 40-year-old was still alive and able to give his son a description of the shooters. He said boys did it. Reuben managed to repeat the description of the shooters a few minutes later when the first deputy arrived on the scene. He was talking in a, 
a subdued, weak voice, but I was down near his face so I could hear what he had to say. And then, after telling the deputy that the shooters appeared to be two teenage boys, he made one last request. He wanted his minister. I think he, he, he knew he was dying. Soon after, the ambulance arrived to rush Reuben to the hospital, but it was too late. Reuben died on the way to the hospital. It was Easter morning. Now that the home invasion had become a homicide, back at the Borkhart house, the investigators searched the crime scene for clues. We found two spent 410 shotgun shells. Evidence that a 410 shotgun was the probable weapon. And then there was what the investigators didn't find. Nothing seemed to be out of place or anything. It didn't seem to be ransacked or anything like that. Nor was there any sign of forced entry. I didn't see any broken windows or open doors or anything like that. But if the killers hadn't broken in, was it possible that a door had accidentally been left unlocked? Jefferson is a rural community surrounded by farmland. Or had one been left that way on purpose? Because when the investigators sat Ruben's son down for questioning, he told them something astonishing. He said the two teens weren't the only people his father had implicated. His dad said to him, I can't believe she did this. Obviously, she being Diane. But why would his stepmother, the beloved teacher's aide that students called Mrs. B, want to kill her husband of 14 years? According to Ruben's son, it was because their seemingly blissful marriage had recently turned sour. She was embroiled in this bitter, contentious divorce with Ruben. He filed for divorce early in 1994. Although, when it came to their failed marriage, Reuben was the one at fault. He was having an affair. The affair had started early in the fall of 1993. He was making some cabinets for a woman in town, and he became friends with the woman, and the two eventually became romantically involved. It wasn't just a fling, either. Rather than something on the side... Reuben made it clear that he considered his new girlfriend to be Diane's replacement. He announced in November of 93 that he was getting a divorce, so obviously everybody knew then. And if they didn't, Diane made sure they did, making a huge scene when she ran into the other woman soon after finding out about the affair. She was just going down the street, which is one of the main streets in Jefferson, and Diane saw her and took off running after her and calling her names. People knew that the Borkerts were having a hard time. People were talking. And considering the circumstances, most of them took Diane's side. Diane was really troubled and needed her friends. In fact, Diane appeared all but shattered by Reuben's infidelity. I would stop in to see her to see how she was going, and she was shaking she was visibly shaking a lot, crying a lot. Said she didn't know what she was going to do with her life. Her friends did what they could to try and help. She was looking for a place to move. And I said that, you know, we would have room for her. As did several other people offer her housing to help her get back on her feet. But despite the offers, Diane had continued to live with Ruben. He'd been sleeping downstairs. His wife had been upstairs during their divorce negotiations. It was an unusual arrangement. One that made Reuben extremely nervous, according to what his son told the investigators. He was definitely afraid that she was going to do him harm in some way. Reuben said he was afraid that his wife would bob at him. He was having an affair, so maybe he had reason to be afraid. But on the plus side, the divorce did offer Reuben a way to get Diane out of the house since he'd owned it prior to their marriage. She was told by the, the judge that she would have to vacate the family home. The ruling had left the already reeling Diane hurt and angry. Everything that she worked towards with him was slipping away. She said, oh my God, I've lost everything. But did that mean Diane had extracted her revenge? That's where things got tricky. She had motive all over the place. What she didn't have was opportunity. And even more complicated for the investigators, her lack of opportunity was partly due to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Once Reuben filed for divorce and things turned acrimonious, sheriff's deputies had made several trips out to the couple's home. 
we had had previous contact with them in reference to domestic situations. In fact, the last time had been the day before the murder. We got a call that there was a domestic situation again, and the deputy went out there. When he got there, the deputy found that Diane had been loading a few things in the back of her car. She'd started making plans to move. You know, she'd been packing things. Including some things that weren't technically hers. Like the sewing machine that had belonged to his first wife. She put it in the trunk of her car, and she made it known to Reuben that she had it. Reuben said, you're not taking that sewing machine. They had a fight over that. And when the deputy arrived? Her story was, Reuben hit me. But while she had the bruise to show for it, the situation was a bit more complicated, according to her stepchildren, who'd witnessed the incident. He went to get the sewing machine out of the trunk. He actually took the keys to get it out, and Diane jumped on his back and started wailing on him, according to the kids. And Reuben flung her off his back, and she fell to the ground. So that's how she got her bruise. In light of that, no one was arrested. But the deputy did decide it was best to separate Reuben and Diane. It was asked of her, is there some place you can go for the weekend to cool this situation down? And curiously, she decided to take her daughter to see the parents of Reuben's first wife. They considered her a grandchild. And that's where the entire case against Diane suddenly fell apart, because they lived three hours away in tiny Tomahawk, Wisconsin. Diane could not have physically done the homicide, because she wasn't here. By dawn on the morning of April 3rd, 1994, it had only been a few hours since Reuben Borkhardt's son had called 911 in Jefferson, Wisconsin, to report that his father had just been shot. It was around... 10 to 4 in the morning when he made that call. According to what Reuben told his son and the first responders, the shooters were two young men. He told me about the people that shot him. However, while Reuben lived long enough to give the investigators a description of his attackers, the twin gunshot blast to his chest ultimately proved fatal. He died in transport to the hospital without ever giving more information or details about who did it. Not to the investigators, at least. But according to what his son told them, Reuben had blamed the shooting on his estranged wife, 44-year-old Diane Borkhart. Reuben had said, I can't believe she would do this. And considering that pretty much the whole town knew that Reuben was having an affair and had recently filed for divorce, the investigators were inclined to believe him, too. We knew about the domestic situation that was going on between the two. In fact, the morning of the shooting was hardly the first time sheriff's deputies had been to the house since Diane found out about the affair. I don't know how many times we got called, but I knew it was a number of times. And that made her a pretty obvious suspect in Reuben's murder. She's the one who's got the most motive. However, the investigators also had a problem. She was out of town. And then there was the fact that Reuben had identified his killers as two teenage boys. It couldn't be Diane who had pulled the trigger. But that didn't mean she wasn't behind it. Obviously, we wanted to talk to Diane. Although by the time the investigators got in touch with Diane, three hours away in the town of Tomahawk, Wisconsin, she'd not only already heard the news that Reuben was dead, she wasn't exactly acting like a suspect. She was upset. You know, I could definitely tell she was upset. And she appeared willing to cooperate. She was supposed to come to the sheriff's department. But then, the appointed time for Diane's interview came and went with no word from the widow. About 25 minutes later, I get a call from an attorney saying she's not coming. She lawyered up quickly. So with Diane refusing to talk, the investigators shifted their focus to finding the shooters. We got together as a unit, and we started talking over what we thought, ideas, this and that. And just about everybody came to the conclusion that this wasn't a professional job. And since Reuben had described his killers as boys, and Diane was a popular teacher's aide at the local high school, that determined the investigators' next step. I went to the school... 
I, I interviewed kids. And almost everyone had something nice to say about Mrs. B. She was someone that the kids trusted. They would confide in her. They said that she was a caring person who always wanted to hear what was going on in their lives. And according to the students at Jefferson High, Diane was always willing to share her troubles, too. She would break down and cry in front of the kids. Kids would come over and they'd say, what's wrong, Diane? Diane was very vocal and told them that her husband was cheating. She drew a lot of sympathy from them. And as the divorce grew contentious, the students said that Diane had asked for more than sympathy. She'd wanted their help catching her husband with his mistress. She gave a camera to one young man and asked that young man to follow them one day to a park and take pictures of them. But had some of them been willing to do more? Had Diane gotten some of her students to kill Reuben? None of the kids the investigators spoke to had heard anything definite. Rumors were circulating, but like, you need more than rumors. Everything stalled at that point. But the investigators weren't all that worried. Instead, they felt that it was only a matter of time. We felt that being kids, they couldn't keep their mouth shut that eventually we would find out. Although, as weeks passed, and then months, the investigators did become concerned. It turned into summer. They weren't getting anywhere. So in September of 1994, six months after the murder, Ruben's family offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to his killers. And soon after that... I'm at my desk, and I get a call, a male voice. I'm calling about the Borkhardt homicide. Have you solved that yet? No, we haven't. And the guy says, well, I know who did it. And when the informant came in to speak to the investigators the next day, he told them that Reuben had been wrong. It wasn't two boys that killed him. It was three. He told me that there was a guy named Doug that was involved, and the other kid was Mike Maldonado. And he didn't know the third guy's name. The Jefferson County authorities knew Mike Maldonado's name, though. If I had to characterize him, he was a little gangbanger. And once the informant gave them Maldonado's name, it didn't take them too long to figure out who Doug was, either. 17-year-old Doug Vest. Doug was related to Michael Maldonado. I believe that they were cousins. According to what the informant had heard from a mutual friend, Maldonado and Vest were the two boys Reuben had seen. He described to me what he was told, that the two went into the house, the third guy stayed upstairs, Maldonado and Vest went downstairs, shot Reuben. But did any of them lead to Diane? Maldonado didn't appear to be the link. He was never in school, or very seldom in school. He was truant a lot. So that left Doug Vest. On September 28th, the investigators brought the 17-year-old in for questioning. And once they got him into the interrogation room, the teenager didn't last long. Doug Best confessed. He confirmed everything the informant had already told them, and more. He provided information on the other boys that were involved. Both Maldonado and the previously unknown third accomplice, 16-year-old Josh Yonke. Josh Yonke and Doug Best were friends. But most of all, Doug Vest revealed why the trio had killed Reuben, the reason the investigators had long suspected. Doug also provided information that Mrs. B, who would be Diane Borker, was the person who wanted Reuben gone. Vest was placed under arrest immediately after his confession. And the next morning, September 29th, both plainclothed and uniformed officers arrived at Jefferson High School with a pair of arrest warrants. They needed to ensure that they, they could arrest them and they wouldn't flee. Josh Yonke was arrested in class. He caused a lot of commotion at the school. And Diane was overseeing a study hall session when the investigators took her into custody. I went up to Diane and I said, Diane Borkart, could you stand up, please turn around so I can handcuff you because you're being arrested for the murder of your husband. Imagine being in this small town high school where everybody knows everyone else and the police are showing up to arrest, you know, the teacher for 
killing her husband. It's unthinkable. Students loved Mrs. B, and they couldn't believe it. Everybody was kind of taken back, didn't think it was possible. On May 11, 1995, Diane Borkhardt walked into a packed courtroom in Jefferson, Wisconsin. The courtroom was crowded. Everybody wanted to see what was going on. The whole community was uh, wrapped up in this story. The 45-year-old was accused of masterminding the 1994 murder of her husband, Ruben. It was like half the city believed Diane was innocent and half believed she was guilty. It was so traumatic for the community. Not only was Diane a popular teacher's aide at the local high school, she was accused of recruiting three teenagers to carry out the murder plot. The three teenagers who ultimately agreed to murder Ruben and did were Douglas Vest, Michael Maldonado, and Joshua Yankee. By the time Diane stood trial, Doug Vest and Michael Maldonado had both been convicted of murder. And Joshua Yankee cut a deal with prosecutors so that he, he could get the shortest sentence in exchange for testifying. But despite the fact that all three of her alleged co-conspirators had either been convicted or made a deal, the authorities were far from sure when it came to putting Diane away for murder. My biggest fear was that she would not get convicted because she did not pull the trigger. And she certainly didn't look like a murderer. In the courthouse setting, she was an unassuming woman, almost kind of mousy. But according to the prosecutor's opening statement, beneath Diane's mousy exterior lurked a vindictive killer. Diane was cast as a very jealous person. And once she found out he'd been unfaithful, she wanted him dead. However, rather than kill Ruben herself, the prosecutors claimed that Diane had done something far more heinous, trick three teenagers into committing the crime. A complete misuse of the authority she was granted as a teacher. And the investigators had two witnesses to explain just how she'd done it. Josh Yonke and Doug Vest. Doug Vest, he's kind of a critical linchpin here. But how had Diane turned him into a killer? When he took the stand, Doug Vest appeared to be a typical 17-year-old. Doug Vest was kind of an unassuming kid. Unassuming, but also vulnerable. Doug Vest apparently didn't have a great home life, and she knew that. In fact, it was something all three of the teenage killers had in common. She was able to sniff out the people that were the most vulnerable. She targeted single-parent kids. And then, once she had identified a likely target, Diane set out to earn their trust. She had a lot of contact and time with a lot of the students in the study hall sessions. And during those study halls, she would talk to the students about their home lives and things that were going on in their lives. She would console them when they were going through problems. However, according to Doug, their conversation became less about his problems and more about hers. She slowly manipulated Doug into feeling sorry for her. And not just over her husband's affair, either. She'd say, well, Reuben beat me up again last night. She would present herself as an abuse victim. Doug Vest bought into her story pretty good. And then, once Doug had bought into her story, she started to talk about maybe he could help her get out of this situation. Then she escalated that to, will you murder him? Although even with all the groundwork Diane had done to groom him, Doug testified that he'd initially balked at the prospect of committing murder. Doug was very resistant and reluctant at first. But Doug said that Diane was persistent. He describes essentially that Mrs. Burkhardt had five or more discussions with him about uh, getting rid of her husband. Although since pleas to his sympathy hadn't worked, Doug said she had eventually taken a different approach. Money. She told him, you kill my husband, I'll get this life insurance policy, I'll get the payout, I'll give you $20,000, two cars, and my engagement and wedding ring. And according to Doug, she'd even paid him a little money up front. $600 in cash? It wasn't much, but when coupled with all the things she'd told him, it was enough to convince Doug to become the point man in Diane. 
Diane's murder plot. Doug went out and he recruited Josh Yankee and Mike Maldonado. I suspect the real motive wasn't wasn't so much greed as being emotionally manipulated by a very predatory woman who is much older. Whatever the reason, Doug Vest testified that once the other two teens were on board, they'd gone to Milwaukee and used part of Diane's $600 to buy a sawed-off shotgun from some of Maldonado's gang connections. Even though he's the youngest of the three in chronological age, he's not the youngest in terms of his life experiences. According to Doug, once they'd acquired the murder weapon, Diane had deliberately provoked a confrontation with Ruben by taking his first wife's sewing machine. She was trying to set her alibi. Then, once the sheriff's deputies had complied by suggesting she get out of town while things cooled off, she took her child with Ruben and went to visit the parents of Ruben's first wife, which is odd in and of itself. And while Diane was conveniently three hours away. Douglas Vest, Joshua Yankee, Michael Maldonado go out to the Borker residence and kill Ruben Borker. On the stand, Doug Vest walked the jury through how the murder had gone down. This is not a sophisticated crime when you really break it down. They've already gone and picked up a sh sort of shotgun in Milwaukee. They pick up some gloves and then drive in Doug Best's car out to the Borkert family home. Although Doug testified that outside the house on that still spring morning, he and Josh had started to have second thoughts. There's some discussion between them about whether they should go in, shouldn't go in. And Michael Maldonado, even though he's actually the youngest of the three, takes the shotgun, says, we're going to do it. So while Josh waited outside... Doug Vest and Michael Maldonado go into the basement where they're expecting to find Ruben Borker. According to Doug, they did find him, just not the way they expected. He is already awake. He's getting up to go to sunrise service for Easter. Unfortunately for Reuben, he wouldn't live to see the sunrise. The first shot was center mass in the sternum area. Reuben went down. The kids backpedaled up the steps, and as they're backpedaling up the steps, Reuben got up. Maldonado then fires another shell at Reuben. The second shot, that put him down. Maldonado and Best beat feet up the stairs, get into the car, off they drive and along the way, throw the gloves out the window, throw the shotgun out the window. The murder weapon had never been found. Doug Vest had told Diane what they did with the weapon, and we feel that she went and found the weapon and disposed of it. Once Doug finished telling his story, Josh Yonke took the stand, too. Mr. Yonke's statements corroborate Mr. Vest. But could either of them be trusted? That was the primary thrust of the defense's opening. The defense goes, a bunch of murderers and liars ask you to believe that what they're telling you is true. According to the defense, Vest and Yonke were simply trying to shift the blame to Diane. When you get caught, the first thing you want to do is spread the blame. And so you can point the fingers at people who aren't even involved simply as an effort to save your own skin. Diane had certainly acted incredulous during their testimony. She would roll her eyes, shake her head at things that the prosecutors said. But that was all she would do. Diane never testified in her own defense. And while the defense didn't deny that Diane had told Doug Vest about Ruben's infidelity, she maintained all the way through that she was not involved, that she wasn't even home that weekend. She had nothing to do with it. What is she going to say other than I confided in them and I was saying, you know, I have all these marital troubles, but I never thought they would, would actually go kill him. That they just took what she said and then ran with it themselves. On May 20th, 1995, the jury in Diane Borkhardt's murder trial announced that it had reached a verdict. The 45-year-old teacher's aide was accused of masterminding the murder of her husband, Ruben. And at times during the two-week trial, it seemed like the entire population of rural Jefferson, Wisconsin, 
had packed into the courtroom to hear the shocking testimony about how Diane had allegedly turned three teenagers into hitmen. Plotting and manipulating and using these kids to kill her husband. The whole community was in shock and disbelief. We had people that just couldn't believe we arrested Diane. There's no way she's involved. So when the verdict was read, you could hear a pin drop. And when the jury found Diane guilty. The gallery, it was like, oh my God. It was the culmination of this year-long mystery. Diane appeared devastated by the verdict. She put her head down and started crying. And the community was divided. Everybody had an opinion and half believed she was guilty, half believed she wasn't. When I was running for district attorney, and I was out campaigning, I knocked on a door in Jefferson. I introduced myself and said I would like their vote, and their comment basically was, uh, yeah, I remember you. You're the one who prosecuted Diane Borkert, and they slammed the door in my face. However, at Diane's sentencing on August 1st, the judge had no doubts that the jury's verdict had been correct. The judge said the, the evidence was overwhelming. He said she was a manipulative, cold woman and he sentenced her to life in prison. She's by far, you know, the, the most evil, manipulative perpetrator in this. Evil, but also foolish, because it was Diane's manipulation that ultimately doomed her. Her fatal mistake for her was hiring teenage boys. I mean, teenagers, they're going to get caught. They make mistakes. They lay up to each other, they brag, and that's what happened in this case. Unionville, Tennessee, August 8th, 2012. It was a quiet Wednesday afternoon in this tiny community of 1,300, an hour south of Nashville. One of those small towns where if you blink, you'll miss it. There's just like two gas stations and post office. The kind of town where nothing ever happens, at least not usually. The first person on the line was screaming and incoherent. The distraught woman on the phone was 54-year-old Susan Walls. She was hysterical. I don't think you could really make out what the nature of the call was. And when the operator asked her to slow down... You're going to have to calm down, okay? Susan handed the phone to her 27-year-old daughter, Dawn. Dawn gets on the line, and you can understand her a little bit better. She went to Nashville uh, to spend time with her daughter's children. One of them was having a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. But when Susan and Dawn got home that afternoon, things appeared to be ransacked. Although, according to Dawn, whoever had ransacked the house appeared to be long gone. They're not still there. No, ma'am, nobody's here to see my mom. All right, honey, I'll get you an officer out there, okay? 911 dispatches it as a theft call. And the deputy nearest the scene responded accordingly. The first deputy who goes out there, he took his time because he thinks he's responding to a theft call that's already occurred. But when he arrived at the house almost 30 minutes later... When he pulls up in the driveway, there's Dawn and Susan. They're crying, hysterical. And once the deputy went inside the house, he discovered why Susan was crying. She has just found her husband dead. The deputy found 55-year-old Larry Walls inside the house, sprawled dead on his bedroom floor. He had been stabbed and beaten severely. Blood was everywhere splattered all over the place. But was the bloody scene really the result of a random home invasion? Or was there a deadly secret lurking in Larry and Susan's past? Born in 1957, Susan Bloom spent her childhood in Indiana. She grew up in a loving home, Christian family. She was brought up Catholic. One of eight children, Susan was quiet and reserved growing up. Susan was kind of shy, but once you got to know her, she was a really loving person. She was the type of person that would do anything for you. Not that many people got past her shyness, especially boys. 
she was kind of quiet, stuck to herself. You know, she wasn't a very outgoing person as far as men. I don't think she ever got a lot of attention from other guys. In fact, it wasn't until 1982, when she was well out of high school, working and living on her own, that she finally caught the eye of one young man, Larry Walls. They met at a bar. Born the same year as Susan, Larry had grown up not far from her in the town of South Bend. He worked in construction. He was a hard worker. And when he met Susan, things quickly became serious. They seemed to be hitting off pretty good. Within months of meeting, Susan and Larry were married. And just a few months after that, Susan gave birth to a daughter. They had Melissa, who was the oldest. Three more children followed in quick succession. A boy and two girls. She loved children. Always, always had a house full of kids. And then, around 1990, when Susan and Larry were both in their early 30s, they left Indiana behind and moved their growing family to Tennessee. They have family here. Three, I believe, of Larry's uncles, his dad's brothers, lived here around Bedford County area. Once in Tennessee, the couple and their four children, the oldest only eight, moved into a trailer park where Larry had arranged for them to live rent-free. He was like the maintenance guy for the trailer park, painting or maybe fixing a fence or plumbing or something. He could do different stuff. However, despite free rent, life was hard. It was just a little two-bedroom trailer. And money was tight, too. Despite the fact that Susan got a factory job to help support the family. She worked at Sanford, which is a pencil company. They live pretty much paycheck to paycheck. However, after years of scrimping and saving, by 1998, the family was finally able to rent a bigger place just outside the tiny town of Unionville. Just an old country, quiet, two-story old house. Larry put his carpentry skills to work, turning the old house into a home. You know... Needed work. He also, in a repeat of his earlier trailer park deal, did chores for the property's absentee owner. He worked on the farm for the old guy to take it off the rent. And when he wasn't working for their landlord, he was either out in the garden. He'd have a great garden every year. He's always proud of his gardens. Or doing odd jobs to earn a little extra money. He was somewhat of a handyman, not necessarily steadily employed. Little construction, little carpentry, just kind of a jack of all trades. Just enough to make his beer money, pretty much. For a steady paycheck, the family depended on Susan. It was mainly mama, her money. She paid the bills. She worked at the pencil factory, I would, I would say about 17 years. And then, after the pencil factory closed down, Susan got a job at a local nursing home. At the nurse home, she did housekeeping, janitorial work. It was a simple life, but Larry and Susan didn't seem to mind. They were just working class folks. They just seemed to be your typical family. And by the time Susan turned 54 in 2011, she'd been with Larry almost 30 years. There was some good times. And with the kids all grown, it looked as if Susan could finally afford to take it easy. Oldest daughter Melissa was already out on her own as was her sister, Dawn. Dawn moved to an apartment in Antioch, Tennessee, which is a, uh, a suburb of Nashville. She had a couple jobs she worked at. She always worked, supported herself. The couple's 28-year-old son still lived at home, but he was supporting himself. He lived with them, and he worked for um, an uncle doing construction. Susan and Larry's youngest daughter was still living with them, too. She had been living with a boyfriend. They had broken up, so she moved back home. Uh, with her children. It was a situation that the children's grandparents wasted no time taking advantage of, especially Larry. He was a pretty good granddad. He liked to take him to his garden and, and let him play in the dirt and things like that. But Larry wouldn't be doting on his grandchildren for much longer, because in August of 2012, just as a comfortable retirement was starting to seem possible for Susan, she would come home to find that her husband had been beaten to death. On the afternoon of August 8, 2012, 54-year-old Susan Walls called 911 to report a break-in at her rural Unionville, Tennessee home. Sue and her daughter Dawn returned to the residence to find the door unlocked. Someone's broken into the house while y'all were gone. Yeah. 
But when the first deputies arrived on the scene more than 20 minutes later, they discovered that they were dealing with far more than a break-in. They found Sue's husband, Don's father, Larry, deceased on the floor. The 55-year-old had been murdered. His head was just bashed in. He had obviously had a multitude of stab wounds all over his body. And it didn't look like he'd made any attempt to resist. He had virtually no defensive wounds of any type. It was apparent that he had been in bed when he was attacked. There was one prominent blood stain at the head of the bed. Which led the investigators to conclude that Larry had been killed in his sleep. Why he'd been killed didn't appear to be a mystery either. Contents of drawers had been taken out, thrown about the house. Couch cushions had been turned over and thrown on the floor. Uh, it was apparent to us that the house had been ransacked. It definitely made it look like it was. they were looking for something. And Larry? He may have simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was perhaps a burglary that went wrong. When the burglar panics and, and murders the homeowner. So, trying to get a handle on when the break-in could have occurred, the investigators turned to the only witnesses they had, Susan and her 27-year-old daughter, Dawn. Questioned by the investigators, Susan told them that she had gotten up early that morning, shortly before her son, who still lived at home, had gone to work. He left for work around 6.30 that morning. Susan said that she and her youngest daughter, who also lived at home, had left shortly after that to take Susan's grandchildren to Nashville for the day. One of the children was having a birthday. They were going to uh, have a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese in Nashville. And Larry, according to Susan, he had been awake when she left that morning. She described how that morning she fixed him breakfast, kissed him goodbye, and headed to Nashville. Susan said her daughter Dawn had joined them at Chuck E. Cheese. She lived in Nashville. And then, after leaving the restaurant... Dawn, Susan, and her youngest daughter had all driven back to her daughter Melissa's house near Unionville. Well, he dropped my younger sister off and let the kids play. And then, while her grandkids played at Melissa's, Susan and Dawn had driven home. They were supposed to come back. I never came back. She had returned home and found his body. The house had been robbed and he'd been murdered. But who would do such a thing? Susan couldn't say. She said, I don't know who could have done this. Although naturally, as Larry's spouse and the person who found his body, the investigators had to consider Susan a potential suspect. Could she have had anything to do with his death? She told us they had a good marriage. She said, we're like any married couple. We fight about different things, but you know, overall, we have a loving relationship. And when the investigators questioned Dawn, she backed her mother up 100%. She said their relationship wasn't perfect, but he was a good dad and a good grandfather. Her account of how they'd spent the day also matched Susan's story. Everybody had met up at Dawn's apartment, gone to Chuck E. Cheese, and then they'd come home and discovered this horrific crime. And just the same as Susan, Dawn said she had no idea who could have killed her father. Neither one of them said, you know, any reason why someone would do this to him. They just didn't understand why something like this would happen. However, while Susan and Dawn said they had no idea who could have killed Larry, when the investigators started questioning the couple's friends and neighbors, they heard a very different story. According to most people, Larry had no shortage of enemies. It was kind of in my head a long list of people that there was problems with. Although according to friends and neighbors, Larry's real problem wasn't people, it was alcohol. He had a drinking problem. I've been over there 9, 10 o'clock in the morning since, and seen him drinking. He'd go two or three days on whiskey binges. He would drink for a week. You know, he wouldn't stop. And inevitably, when Larry was drunk, that's when his problems with people began. He was a good guy when he wasn't drunk. When he started that drinking, though, he would always just try to start something. Which meant that there was no shortage of people with a grudge against Larry. He had to been into a fight a couple weeks before that with... His cousin's husband, Larry's nephew, him and Larry had been into a really violent fight a couple weeks before. Was it possible that rather than a robbery gone wrong, someone Larry had picked a fight with had broken in and settled things once and for all? When the investigators took a closer look at the crime scene, a few things stood out. The house had been ransacked, but everything of any values was still in the house. 
they ransacked the house so that it would look as though they were there to steal. But they hadn't come to steal. Instead, based on what the medical examiner uncovered in Larry's autopsy, the intruders had clearly come looking to kill. The medical examiner determined he had been stabbed 49 times. Any one of the stab wounds would have killed him. In fact, it appeared that the intruders had been so determined to kill Larry that they more than finished the job. Some of the wounds appeared to be post-mortem. It was an extremely violent crime. There's something more to this than just a stranger committing a home invasion of this home and in the process murdering Larry Walls. But while the investigators suspected Larry's murder was more than just a home invasion, they only knew two things for certain. One was that the bloody scene offered no clues to the killer's identity. There were prints. Couldn't identify them because they were smeared. And the other was that Susan and Dawn had an airtight alibi. Chuck E. Cheese has surveillance videos, so we were actually able to watch them uh, just playing the games and, and things like that. That's where they were when the murder took place. Still, there were a few things about Susan's story that bothered the investigators. She talked about preparing Larry's breakfast that morning. She talked about him being up out of bed. Yeah, it was apparent that he had been in bed when he was attacked. And then there was her 911 call. In the 911 call, she spends most of her time explaining where they've been that afternoon. What's going on, ma'am? I don't know why I was going to with my daughter. Her daughter, Dawn, did the same thing when she took the phone. I was in high school, and I told you myself, I heard my daughter said that. It was more building up an alibi than establishing what had happened at the residence. Was Susan and Dawn's alibi as staged as the robbery? The investigators were starting to wonder. That did grow up uh, a few red flags. However, the investigators had barely begun to suspect Susan and her daughter knew more about Larry's death than they let on when something happened that would break the case wide open. By the evening of August 9th, it had been a little more than 24 hours since sheriff's deputies had discovered Susan Wall's husband, Larry, brutally slain in the couple's home outside rural Unionville, Tennessee. It was a very, very bloody murder. Mr. Wall was stabbed 48 times. And while it had initially looked as if the murder was the result of a robbery... Everything was turned upside down. The TV was overturned. Just stuff was everywhere. The investigators were starting to suspect that Susan knew more about her husband's death than she had initially let on. Not only had the supposed robbers come and gone without taking anything, Susan seemed strangely preoccupied with establishing her alibi. The 911 call, she spent a great deal of time being very uh, specific on where she was at at a particular time, which, which we thought was seemed unusual. And the investigators were still wondering about that. When a few hours after the murder, they received an urgent call from the ex-boyfriend of Susan's youngest daughter. When he found out that, that Larry had been killed, he contacted the sheriff's department. He told us about a conversation that he had had with Susan a couple of weeks prior to Larry's killing. And what she had allegedly said may have explained why she had been so anxious to establish an alibi. She told him or confided in him that she had found a couple of guys in Nashville who were going to come down and, in her words, slit his throat. At the time, the ex-boyfriend said he'd figured it was all talk on Susan's part, especially considering the cut-rate price the killers had apparently agreed to. He didn't believe that a hitman would kill someone for $400. That was a cheap, cheap price for life. But then, when he heard that Larry had been murdered... He realized that, yes, indeed, perhaps there is a hitman who would kill someone for $400. So at 9 o'clock on the evening of the 9th, after her daughter's ex-boyfriend had come forward with his shocking information, the investigators asked Susan and her 27-year-old daughter, Dawn, to come back down to the sheriff's department for a follow-up interview. And once they sat down with Susan in the interrogation room, We'd start confronting her with the testimony of the daughter's boyfriend. Accused of masterminding her husband's murder, Susan didn't immediately deny it. Instead, she started telling the investigators an entirely new story, one that was very different from what she'd initially told them. It's a 180-degree change. 
Uh, the first statement was, we had a great marriage. I can't understand why anyone would do this. But this time... Susan begins talking about domestic violence. She talked about years of abuse that she had endured from Larry. She claimed that she had been a victim of it virtually the entire length of their marriage. This went on for 30 years. She couldn't take it anymore. According to Susan, the abuse was a product of her husband's alcoholism. You get a drunk on it, yeah, you just lose it. And while Larry's drunken beatings were bad, Susan claimed that if she tried to leave him, he promised to take the kids and disappear. He told her she would never see him again. And if she ever tried to report his abuse. Larry threatened to kill Susan if anyone talked to the police. I think she truly believed if she left and took the kids, he would find her and he would kill her. So according to Susan, she had lived in a nightmare for 30 years, mostly to protect her children. She claimed that the children had been victims. She said when we were grown, she would leave, but when we were grown, she still had my youngest sister living with her and my brother, and then she started having kids. So she pretty much started raising her grandkids and just stayed. But after suffering for so long, why kill Larry now? What had pushed her over the edge? According to Susan, the answer was simple. She feared that he was now going to start abusing the grandchildren. And according to Susan, she was in a position to do something about it, thanks to her daughter Dawn's new roommate, 25-year-old Jason Sterick. He apparently made himself out to be a badass. He claimed to have been a bounty hunter. Although the purported bounty hunter was currently waiting tables, which is how he met Dawn. They knew each other from having worked at Steak and Shake. And according to Susan, it was Dawn who'd first approached Jason about killing her father. Dawn told uh, Stark about the abuse, and this really enraged him. And his, his code, you just didn't hurt children. And then, once Dawn had convinced Jason to kill Larry... She said that Dawn made all the arrangements. They had actually set it up so that they would both be at Chuck E. Cheese restaurant up in Nashville, about 50 miles north, so that they would have a solid alibi. Meanwhile, according to Susan, Jason had recruited a second man to help him carry out the hit, 19-year-old Sean Gerhardt. Sean Gerhardt was just a follower. If Jason Sterick had not gotten him involved, Sean Gerhardt's not the type of person that would have gone forth and committed a murder. Once the arrangements had been made and the accomplice recruited, Susan said she had taken her grandchildren to Nashville and met with Dawn to establish their alibis, while Jason and Sean drove out to Unionville to commit the murder. We think Larry was asleep when they came into the house. They stabbed him nearly 50 times. They beat him in the head so many times that, as I recall, the medical examiner could not determine the number of wounds he had to his head. And when they were sure Larry was dead, Jason and Sean went their separate ways. And then Sean returned back to Nashville to Chuck E. Cheese, met with Sue and Dawn, and informed them that indeed Larry had been killed. Questioned after her mother, Dawn essentially confirmed everything Susan had just said. We confronted her with the fact that her mother had confessed. As a result of that, then Dawn confessed to her role in having Larry killed. Dawn, according to her confession, had served as the middleman, arranging all the details of the hit. She confessed to having conversations directly with Jason Sterick, um, and a, an agreement was reached between her and Sterick that she would pay Jason $400 for coming down or going down to Unionville to kill Larry. And while she hadn't paid them up front, Dawn did cover their expenses. There were some supplies that he needed uh, to commit the killing, but he didn't have any money to pay for those supplies. So she had given him her debit card. They went to Walmart, where they purchased bandanas, rubber gloves. In addition to detailing the arrangements for the hit, Dawn also echoed everything that Susan had said about Larry being abusive. And she leveled a new accusation against her father. Dawn, in her second statement, did claim that Larry had sexually abused her. Once, when she was only 15. She had a lot of hate for Daddy. However, like her mother, Dawn said that her primary motivation 
was to protect an entirely new generation of victims, the grandchildren. Dawn's version was that we just could not allow this to continue. Although despite that, Dawn claimed that she'd had second thoughts on the morning of the murder. As part of her confession, she told us that there was a point on the morning of the killing that she had tried to call it off. But she said that neither Jason nor Sean answered their phones or her texts. Apparently, they were already on their way uh, to Unionville to commit the murder. And Dawn claimed that her second thoughts had turned to horror when she and Susan found her father's body. Dawn had asked to smother him to death, and she actually became very upset about the way that they killed him, uh, beating him and stabbing him multiple times. They weren't supposed to have done it so violently. The gruesomeness of the murder, I think, had really worn, particularly on Dawn. Which may explain why, once her interview was over, Dawn actually agreed to uh, try to assist in capturing both Jason Sarek and Sean Gerhardt. Surprisingly, once they had both confessions and Dawn's promise to cooperate, the investigators didn't place Susan and her daughter under arrest. They knew they had already did it, but they actually let them leave. Whether the abuse claims had earned the investigators sympathy or they feared taking them into custody would tip off Sean and Jason, Susan and Dawn spent the night at a friend's house in Unionville. And of course, they couldn't stay in the house because it was the crime scene. And I told them they could come and stay until everything was okay. But they were back at the sheriff's department the next morning, where investigators had Dawn call both Jason and Sean and leave messages on their voicemail. Dawn placed a call to them saying, Hey, my mother and I have the rest of your money. Uh, we would like to meet with you and give you the money. Unfortunately, the meeting never happened. Neither Jason nor Sean returned Dawn's call. Apparently, the two of them were suspicious, wouldn't communicate with her at all, so they had to go on sort of a manhunt for them. It was a short manhunt, though. By late that night, both Jason Sterick and Sean Gerhardt were in custody. And when the investigators arrested the alleged hitmen, they discovered an amazing piece of evidence, considering it had been four days since the murder. Jason Sterick, his belt had uh, blood on it. With the bloodstained belt apparently confirming Susan and Dawn's story, once Sterick and Gerhardt were in custody, the investigators finally placed the mother and daughter duo under arrest for murder. It was crazy, you know. It was the middle of the night, and uh, it was a lot of police cars and, and police, and it was a little bit scary, you know, because they had my house surrounded. They came in and they arrested them. On May 5th, 2014, almost two years after she'd called 911 and reported finding her husband Larry dead in her rural Tennessee home, Susan Walls went on trial for murder. The 56-year-old was accused of hiring two men to commit the crime. It was going to be $400 to have him murdered. And Susan had already confessed to being in on the murder plot. She admits that she was willing to pay for it. She admits she left the house to facilitate them coming in to commit the murder. The case was, was strong against Susan. However, while she had confessed to arranging the hit, Susan claimed that she had only killed Larry to escape decades of abuse. She had just had the crap knocked out of her and she couldn't deal with it anymore. And her allegations certainly gave the prosecutors reason to worry. We were afraid the jury might be sympathetic because he had been abusive to her in the past. But did that justify murder? Not according to the prosecution's opening statement. She could have reached out to law enforcement, and she didn't do that. Instead, prosecutors said that Susan had decided to take the law into her own hands. It was her idea to have her husband killed. And the prosecutors had a witness willing to back that up. Susan's 29-year-old daughter... Dawn. When people are looking at a potential life sentence, they will not hesitate to point the finger at anyone else, including a mother and a daughter. Like Susan, Dawn had confessed to being in on her father's murder. She acknowledged that she had told her mother about a couple of guys that she knew, and she felt like that she could get them to do it. She was very remorseful for what had happened. I think she felt just really bad about the role that she had played. And once charged with first-degree murder, Dawn had made a deal with the prosecutors to testify against her mother. That agreement was made without any promises of leniency. 
And that may have been wise on the prosecutor's part. Because while Dawn did take the stand for the prosecution, her testimony focused on her father's abuse. Dawn said that she had been sexually molested and described the abuse that had been going on against her and her mother and other family members um, just all their lives. And she told the jury that fear had driven her and her mother to consider a desperate solution. They had been discussing on and off since Dawn was 15, the possibility of having Larry killed. It's very sad. You had an entire family that had suffered under this man for 30 years, but they never told the police. They let it build up until finally she snapped. Dawn said it was the spring of 2012 when her mother had finally decided to turn their idle talk into action. There was one last incident of abuse where Susan had gotten a black eye. It was no worse than what she'd endured for years, but this time, according to Dawn, she said, that's it, I've had enough. Over the years and dealing with that, it was just too much. She just couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. And according to Dawn, when Jason Sterick said he was willing to kill Larry, her mother had leaped at the offer, and she had gone along with it, arranging everything according to her mother's wishes. I was like, well, why would you do that? It's my mom. Plus, according to Dawn, Susan told her that Larry was sexually abusing one of his grandchildren, just as he allegedly abused her. I think Susan knew if she pushed Dawn's button on that particular issue that that would get more cooperation from Dawn. Dawn testified that Susan had told Jason Starrett the same thing, too, and gotten much the same reaction. He really became interested in being involved once he found out that grandchildren were being harmed. But the prosecutors wondered, was it possible that Dawn and Jason had both been plagued by Susan? There was zero indication that Larry Walls ever harmed a grandchild. Still, there was no denying that Larry had abused Susan. Everyone knew this was going on. And during the investigation, there had been no shortage of friends and neighbors willing to back up Susan's claims. You could expect every few weeks that she would have a black eye or a busted mouth, um, bruises. However, the prosecution argued that Larry's abuse didn't excuse what Susan had done. This was not a situation where one day something happened and she grabbed a gun and defended herself. Susan had options including friends and neighbors that were more than willing to take her in, too. People testified that, yeah, we would have been more than happy to let her live with us. So what her real motive was, I don't know. It was just to have her husband killed for whatever reason. This was a very violent crime that, in our mind, was completely unnecessary. But would the jury agree? When the defense started laying out their case, they portrayed Larry as a monster. The defense really centered on the abuse. And to counter Dawn's testimony, they had a powerful witness of their own, Susan's oldest daughter, Melissa. She told about her upbringing, what life was with her father. According to Melissa, life with Larry was a nightmare. My brother was 10 years old. My dad would hit him in the head with a two by four. He liked to put fear in the kids. However, according to Melissa, no one had more to fear than her mother. I was eight years old. And watched him choke her till she passed out and hit the floor. And there was no escape, her daughter claimed. Larry went out with went after Susan. Because it's, that's his bread and butter. And that's his life. Mama worked so he could get drunk and go mess with other women and do what he wanted to. Plus, Melissa said that her mother was the only thing that stood between the children and Larry's drunken rage. She'd step in and take a beating for us if she had to. And the beatings Susan endured were horrifying, according to her daughter. She'd throw her downstairs, pull her hair, kick her, hit her, throw anything he could at her. She looks like she's pushing 80, because she's been beat on so much. But while the defense made it clear that Susan had more than enough reason to want her husband dead, they disputed the idea that she had been the mastermind behind the murder. The defense essentially was that all she did was say a few things. She would say stuff when, you know, when he was drunk and hitting on her, I wish he was dead, or, you know, I wish he, someone would just kill him. Instead, the defense argued that it was Susan's daughter, Dawn, who'd followed through and arranged the hit. She's the one that set it up. It was her roommates. Um, 
She's the one that gave the debit card to equip the murderers with the items that they needed to commit the murder. Everything's late on Dawn. And according to the defense, when she got caught, Dawn had taken the easy way out and cut a deal with the prosecutors, blaming the murder on her mother in an attempt to excuse her own guilt. Dawn said that it was all Sue, that Sue done everything, and, and she just was the backup. I don't believe any of that for a second. Perhaps, although as the prosecutors argued in closing, before the case went to the jury, no matter who had arranged the details, the ultimate responsibility rested with Susan. If she had not wanted Larry Walls dead, he wouldn't have been dead because Dawn wouldn't have come up with this on her own and recruited these guys to murder her father. It was it was Susan getting Dawn involved, Dawn willing to be involved, and Dawn getting Jason and Sean involved. On May 9th, 2014, the jury announced that it had reached a verdict in the murder trial of 56-year-old Susan Walls. The mother of four was accused of masterminding the August 2012 murder of her husband, Larry. She was part of the conspiracy, even though she didn't lay a hand on him. At trial, the defense argued that the murder had been motivated by decades of abuse at Larry's hands. We certainly were worried that the jury might feel sorry for her. Plus, they argued that it was Susan's daughter, Dawn, who'd really been behind the murder. She set it up where the men would come to the house and kill. But would either of those be enough to sway the jury? It all came down to the reading of the verdict. The jury found her guilty. Susan Walls was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. I was devastated. I really thought that she had a chance to go home. Instead, Susan received a sentence of 60 years for murder and 21 years for conspiracy, although she would technically be eligible for parole. Given her age, she will die in prison unless she is successful in some type of appeal. Friends and supporters were outraged, considering all the abuse Susan had suffered. She had been through enough. She's been tortured. She's been abused for 30 years. Where's the justice? And the sense of injustice grew even deeper when Susan's daughter Dawn pleaded guilty and was sentenced to only 23 years for her role in the murder. How do you take two people that charged with the same crime and the same everything and try to turn one against the other? How does one get to 23 years and one gets life? Although, according to her supporters, there is one consolation. While Susan may be in prison, she's finally free of her husband's abuse. Even though she's in jail, she's not such a nervous, stressed-out wreck anymore because she spent 30 years in a prison, worse than any prison She's one of the strongest people I know to go through that for 30 years and to still keep going every day for her kids. Every day. She never gave up. If we can watch this video and learn about these warning signs, we will be educated instead of just entertained. More importantly, we will be able to detect these warning signs and take the necessary steps to remove ourselves from someone who is a potential danger or threat to our safety. This video is an example of someone who took the life of someone they know. There were warning signs prior to the tragic incident depicted in this video and even though the warning signs vary in each video we present, they all follow the same theme. The key is to not only recognize these warning signs, you will have to take the necessary steps to remove yourself from danger if you recognize these signs in your life. Here are a few key early warning signs to consider. 1. Your significant other is verbally or physically abusive. 2. You are involved in a separation or pending divorce and the other party is making threatening comments or statements. 3. You are divorced and involved in child custody litigation. 4. You have excessive life insurance at the request of your significant other. 5. Your significant other hides their cellular telephone, has a second phone, protects their social media passwords, obtains a P.O. box, or engages in some behavior that is secret. 6. Your significant other begins to focus on getting into better physical shape or significantly changes their attire. 7. Your significant other uses alcohol excessively or is addicted to drugs. 8. Your significant other's family is overly critical of the way you do things, especially related to raising your children. 9. Your significant other begins spending significantly more time away from home or starts traveling more than in the past. 10. If any of these warning signs apply to you, your behavior, or your family.